and we're going to talk about film scoring, which is an integral part of the film experience that I think a lot of audiences are, are mostly um, unaware of. Uh, but it's a very important emotional part of the experience, as I'm sure the most of you know. And to my left are four extremely amazing composers, all, um, all of which have a, um, a movie that's being screened here this year, which is great. And I'm going to ask each of them to kind of um, introduce themselves and the, the movie that they have here, starting with, with Cody. All right. Testing. Uh, hi, I'm Cody Westheimer uh, from Los Angeles, and thanks to ASCAP for having us all here. That's pretty cool. Uh, the film I uh, wrote the music for is How I Became an Elephant, directed by that guy right there with the... <laughs> Sam, raise your hand. <laughs> awesome. Oh, was I supposed to... Oh, uh, no, that's it. All right. Oh. Joey? Yes. Hi, my name is Joey Newman. Um, I have a film here called Any Day Now, and my wonderful filmmakers are in the back as well, which I'm sure they're going to heckle me. Travis Fine, just see if I see and anyway, um, and yeah, next up. I'm Josh Myers, I'm from Seattle, Washington, and the film I did is called Rising from Ashes. It's a documentary about the first Rwandan cycling team. Uh, my name is Brian Carmody, and I scored uh, SOM, which follows four candidates trying to pass the Master Sommelier exam in the wine industry. Great. So, um, how did each of you um, get into scoring films? And tell us like a little bit more about your backstory, Cody. Do I have to start every time? Yes. Actually, no. I should alternate. <laughs> oh, Joey, <laughs> you go. Uh, That's much more fun. So. Um, I started, uh, well, I, I went to Berkeley College of Music. Um, I started off as a drummer in my, in my music life as a child, and I always wanted to play drums. I played piano as well. Um, but then I went to Berkeley, and I thought I was going to be a studio drummer until I just completely fell in love with scoring for film and television and just music and everything else in general. So I knew that I think it would be more, uh, my love of film and my love of collab collaboration kind of, I think, showed when I, you know, just got my first chance to score anything and work in that medium, which was just phenomenal. So from that point forward, I did film scoring, I came back, I worked in television with a composer named Snuffy Walden. Uh, then from that point forward, I kind of continued my television career while doing indie films and video games and things like that. So um, that's pretty good. That was the question, the backstory, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Josh? I have a rock music background. I played in bands all through junior high and high school. Um, I think I was about 20 and I just had like kind of an epiphany moment and wanted to be a film composer. Went to college, um, studied composition and got my degree and then moved to LA and um, was there for about five years and then I moved to Seattle in 2006. And Brian? Uh, actually we have kind of similar backgrounds. I was a self-taught rock drummer for quite a long time and then uh, Got, really got into jazz when I lived in San Francisco for 11 years um, and f started to feel the limitations of uh, you know being primarily a drummer. I did play some piano but I didn't have uh, a wide knowledge of harmony and melody the way I wanted to so I decided to go back to school and I got a, my master's and doctorate at USC and studied composition along the way there and kind of got into it that way. Awesome. Now, it's not easy to get into this uh, industry. How did each of you get the film that you scored uh, that's being screened here? And what was the overall um, image that the filmmaker had for you in doing the score? I'm going to start with uh, Brian. <laughs> uh, Jason and I uh, met. I was playing, I have a, a few weekly gigs in Los Angeles that I, I play a jazz trio. And uh, it was at my Tuesday gig uh, in Beverly Hills. And he and his wife were there just having dinner and drinks with some friends. And he was kind of actively looking for someone to score the movie. And he knew that he wanted half the score to be jazz and half the score to be classical. So. Um, Originally, he approached me to do the, the jazz section until he found out that I also had a classical composition background. Um, but yeah, I was just playing in the club and liked what he was hearing, so he came up and got my card. That's how we met. Awesome. Uh, 
That's great, man. Joey? Um, so Michael Maker, Travis Fun, and I, we've actually known each other for a long time uh, before we even started working together. My wife uh, knew his wife, Christine, early on, so I've, I've been been over 10 years, we've probably plus known each other. And I knew Travis um, kind of towards the end, he's been in the entertainment business for a long time, and then he, he left, became a commercial airline pilot, um, did a fantastic film a couple of years ago called The Space Between, which was about, an exp um, you know, kind of like a 9-11 story, so a framework of a, of a uh, relationship story. And then he made that, we made that movie, which was incredible, and then this movie came along as his, as his next feature, and uh, this has been an amazing experience on this one, too. Um, this story would be much more of a, uh, I think of just a deeper emotional impact um, about two, two gay men adopting a Down syndrome boy. So it's really, it was, it's a poignant thing, and it's particularly because of the time frame of today, it's still happening, it's still difficult. Um, but uh, it's truly one of the best relationships I, I have today working is this, this collaboration with, Chris, with Travis and Christine. So have you found that it's, it's often the case that after you're, you've, you've done my like one film that they'll ask you to do more, like they had a good experience, and, 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 and like a lot of the work that you get is from a repeat customer? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in terms of all of that, this is, I think, a very unique experience because we were all friends before we even ever worked together. And this is the, I, I kind of feel more like the dream experience of being able to work with people who you love yeah. already beforehand and then finding this incredible creative collaboration that you have. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, I'm honored and, and that he asks me to score again and again, which is great. I mean, certainly the, those type of like, you know, a John Williams, you know, Spielberg or some sure. Mechas, you know, thing that you kind of look for and hope for in terms of create creativity and and, um, and challenging. I mean, I think the other thing is is that because he's already an artist and actor, he already has, he has his own kind of creative way of going about it, his input with the actors, his input to the story, and then I put my creative component on that too, and it's just a great blend. And you find that shorthand, all that sure. great way of working. And But in tele I work a lot in television, and it's kind of different there. It's, it is... There is a loyalty factor to some clients, but at the same time, it's, television is kind of a factory. So, right. you know, you never know if you're going to come back on some of those things or not, even if you think you will. So. <laughs> Josh, and this is also the third film that you worked on with this. Um... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, T.C. Johnstone, the director um, I've known for eight or nine years. He hired me for a couple of shorts, 2005-2006-ish, um, and um, yeah, he just keeps hiring me, which is awesome, and I mean, this business is all about relationships, and that, that's, yeah, he's a great guy, he's, I'm honored to be a part of this particular film, because it's, it's really beautiful, if you have a chance, um, it screens tomorrow at one o'clock at the Opera House, and um, he had a really clear vision for the score, um, he had big ideas for it, and I told him what it was going to cost, and he delivered, and I mean, it's definitely the... As far as scale goes, the, the biggest thing I think I've done in the film world. So. That's great. Cody, um, how did you get your film? And tell us about the experience of it. So it's kind of a, uh, <laughs> Tim's laughing back there. So I was uh, quite the animal activist uh, growing up through high school. Um, I started like the environmental club at uh, <laughs> at my high school and was made fun of a lot. It was It wasn't cool to be uh, green at that point. But uh, my main passion was orcas, actually, killer whales, um, and SeaWorld and so forth. And this ties in because uh, I can't remember exactly what prompted it, but I caught wind of Tim's first film, which uh, is called, uh, if I cor remember correctly, Lolita, uh, Slave to Entertainment. And it's about a, a captive orca in Miami, Sequoia, is that right? Um, and uh, it was a really hot topic. And I looked everywhere to try to see this film, couldn't find it. So I finally. <clears throat> Downloaded it illegally. <laughs> I, I was just really curious. I really wanted to see the film, and apparently, he put it up there. I, th I think you put it up there, or no? Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I tried to talk my way out of that one. Anyway, so I emailed him, uh, told him I really liked the film. I thought it was really incredible. I was naturally a little upset I didn't get to score it because <laughs> I, it was a, an issue that was very close to my heart, and. Um, but that was where we kind of met, um, just that online in communication probably seven or eight years ago. Is that that long ago, perhaps? It was a while back. So we've been friends ever since. He's kind of, he's a bit of a hero of mine, uh, to be honest. I mean, travels the world, you know, making guerrilla films, uh, 
not gorilla the animal, but like, you know, uh, a gorilla. <laughs> anyway, um, and so this film came along um, and it just was a perfect fit. Um, it's about uh, how I become an elephant is about, um, it's basically the elephant trade in Thailand um, shown through the eyes of um, a young girl. She's 13 years old and she's an activist. So obviously I saw a bit of myself in her that um, in terms of someone just trying to, you know, taking a passion and really running with it, she goes to Thailand and um, it's, Tim describes it as a love story, which is definitely true. It's just her love of elephants just trumps all. And um, it's really, you know, a really passionate project. It's a couple times um, during the whole process, I, I found myself almost having to turn the TV off um, just because there's some so quite, watch. Yeah. quite brutal moments. And I'm sure you guys can relate to that. I, I don't mean to open up a new topic here, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but um, it was just a very, yeah, I don't, I'll stop rambling. No, okay. So th did the um, experience of like working on the film inspire you to go to like Africa? I know that you and yeah. your wife you know, went there like afterwards, right? And you a a little bit. I mean, I, I think that's all been a kind of a collective part of the process. Right. I'm a big animal person. I've always wanted to go to Africa, but um, and so uh, my wife and I were able to go to Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda this last summer. Um, but what's really interesting, actually, um, that happened was Julia, who has always been an animal lover, my wife, um, as well, she absolutely fell in love with elephants on that trip. And now she's like a huge elephant person. I mean, right. um, she's really involved with the uh, organization called the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, which is all about... Uh, it's an orphanage uh, for orphaned elephants from the poaching trade uh, right. in Nairobi, and and she's just full, you know. So this year, if, if this film had come around like two years later, <laughs> I think she would be twisting my arm to, to steal it from me. <laughs> but um, that's awesome, yeah. Joey. I also know that you have like a very um, sentimental like attachment to the, the film that you scored. If you can tell us like a bit about the experience. Of, of, of like watching the film and going to the screening this morning and seeing the response that the audience had? Yeah, I was, uh, I was telling Sean that um, it was, uh, the, our, our film has been on the festival circuit for a while, but this was the first time I had been able to see the audience reaction and to hear the questions that were asked and to hear Travis um, speak about the film, which was so incredible. And we also had our, 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 our wonderful actor, I said, right there, who was our, our down syndrome boy, who was just phenomenal, got a standing ovation. It's really, it's touching, it's very touching, very incredible. Um, the cinema, you know, Travis is uh, one of the best parts about working with him is the content that he chooses. The things that move him move me. And when he came to me, you know, we, we have this joke about this kind of like, you know, what kind of pitch you would have talking about two gay men adopting a down syndrome boy in the 70s, one being a drag queen who's singing. You know, it's like, it, it, it's like, okay, but when you get down to the deep, kind of part of it, it's uh, two people in love who want to raise a boy, who want to have a son. I mean, I have three girls, I can totally relate to that concept. And I think the wonderful way about it is that the character, um, Rudy, is, does it through, you know, he wants to be a singer. So of course, musically for me, it's, it's great. I've got all these, these elements to work from. I've got um, Alan Cumming, who's a fantastic singer and fantastic actor, does, he gets to sing. I get to kind of work with that component. Uh, weave that through my score, and then, um, and, and then in the end, actually, we have a fantastic. We we're lucky enough to get Rufus Wainwright to write an original song, so I did the string. So it's like I went through this whole process of music right to the end. I mean, this is the end credit song, right? And it's um, all of it was just incredible. And the restraint that Travis, he's one of those those uh, directors in particular that needs music at the right times, not wall to wall, not just because, not because we think. And we've gone through some things where sometimes we option, we try it out, and he'll look at it. And I go, no, no, it's not working. And that's pretty unheard of in a lot of ways. You know, I'm so used to intelligence, it's a lot of music. You know, they wall, want you to do, they're a lot of that kind of thing. But they just don't think of it in the same way. Um, that's the difference between working on a passionate project like this. Um, and you know, no matter what budget you have, it's really just about people who really know what they want for that film. And then I'm coming in there to go with, that, go with his vision, give my stamp, my thoughts on it, and we collaborate, and we work it out, we find a way, and I think He's actually one of the few, maker, few filmmakers who have actually allowed me to really write a restrained score much simpler than I thought I, I, I could because, you know, a lot of us, we want to challenge, we want to write a bunch of music, right. we want to, and, and it just doesn't need it. And with Travis's films, you realize the emotional impact that really has, which is something I hadn't had an opportunity to work on until, I, until we worked together. That's so, great. Yeah. Um, Brian, 
as an instrumentalist and as a guy who often is out there playing live, how do you feel about the use of live instruments in the score, and, and how did the experience of being out there and playing all the time shape how you approach the film? Um, I think probably everybody here has had the experience of the, the budget like dictates how much sound library uh, you know you have to use versus live instruments. Um, my personal stance is I try to do whatever possible to always have live instruments and uh, if that means you know scoring for a duet instead of a uh, you know sound library uh, 60 piece orchestra I'll, I'll go that route because I feel um, in general as good as some of the sound libraries are, and some of them are actually quite amazing, they never um, have the same kind of uh, integrity in a way that live musicians uh, can give. Um, even if you go in and, and do all the nuancing of the MIDI, you know, the velocity points, and you know, you can really fool a lot of listeners, but it still is missing some you know the human element. There's something that they they just can't uh, that can't be replaced by the by the sound library. So um, I was really lucky in that uh, Jason was totally on board with uh, using the 100% live instruments. There's nothing MIDI on the, the whole score. Um, so that was kind of a blessing because he he agrees with what I was talking about. And you know we still did the mock-up process and everything so that we could agree uh, on the cue and. Um, the intensity of it and the general vibe and whatnot, but when we got down to it, we took uh, it into the studio and recorded all live instruments. So that's great. Yeah. Um, you know, like all of you have, you know, it, on or in scoring an indie film, often one of the biggest hurdles that you have is there's often not a whole lot of money, and you sort of I mentioned that, but uh, and also often not a whole lot of time. Sometimes there's more time than others. But how do you work when? You know what the <laughs> film needs, but there's just not the like, money there to make all that live um, like instrumentation happen. Like, what do you do? Like, like how is your approach to get the film like what it needs, even though there's not like a whole lot of like, money to spend? And Cody, well, it's that's a tremendously challenging part of the job, which I kind of get these days. I kind of get excited about it, honestly. Like, right. trying to it's, you're almost feeling like you're trying to fit like a you know. What, what is the expression, the, the round box into a, a square hole, or I, I think it's the opposite. But um, oftentimes you're really trying to, to figure out a way to pull something off that, that for, for Tim's movie, honestly, we, we didn't really have any budget. I mean, it was a really, truly a labor of love, and I was, I, since I was, it's an issue I was really behind, I basically donated my services for this. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the scoring, we, we needed either a broader sound, so it was more orchestral, um, and I was just, trying as hard as I possibly possibly could to keep it you, with a with a documentary you don't want to go too big um, to make it like sound like a huge Hollywood orchestra anyway so I was using a lot of chamber sounds and I then I I play a lot of instruments especially like in terms of the Asian type of instruments I play a lot of flutes and stuff like that so we were able to give it a live flair like that um, let me think it's just you know you try you try to keep it as organic as possible um, in, in other indie films I've scored, you know, we might keep it to three or four live musicians and a very small kind of chamber sound, and that's really effective for, especially scripted. That's great. Films for me. Josh, um, most of the films here that we're talking about are, are um, documentaries, like as you mentioned. Is there a different like approach that you have between scoring one of those, like a doc or a scripted film? Um, I don't. No, no, not as much. Uh, like, what do you think, Joey? Maybe you, you have like an yeah. Um, <laughs> well, funny enough, I've done um, I've basically only done one doc, which actually had a little little music uh -huh. because it was a doc about the act audition. So it was a uh -huh. lot of dialogue, which was great, and it was um, it, it was effective. I think the um, uh, it, it, it kind of getting back to the question too. It's like you know the indie indie film world. It, there is a limited budget on it, true, but luckily. Some films, in particular, even on Travis's films, we, we had just enough of what we needed. We knew we were going to be small, and you know, luckily he went for the right kind of component. And if I asked, I said, listen, we need to go a little bit more to do this, 
he would he would do it. Mm -hmm. But we still kept it within you know a comfortable ish range enough to where we had that magic that in particular Brian yes. was talking about because that's the magic. The magic isn't a live instruments. Right. And I know it's difficult when you, when you I mean in my TV world it's part synth it's part it's a hybrid of synth and, and but um, live component all of us here would, would say the same thing. And know Cody is great on all these instruments too which is great. Live component it, it gives that human integrity to your project. Mm -hmm. It makes it stand out. It makes all of that happen. Without it it just you, you can you can do anything you want to nuance it as much as possible. It's never going to have the same kind of quality. So like, even if it's just one instrument, on hearing the, top the breath, of the bed, yeah. one hearing sample, the phrasing, nice all of there. that, right. all of it's 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 all it's all human because it's just one human contact interpreting right. the music as it is when people are watching it and they'll connect to it. You know, that's awesome. just in a live concert. Yeah. Um, Josh, you've worked on video games and movies and corporate stuff and then you're working on records you're kind of like all over the place how do you juggle your time and how do you wear all those hats it's difficult um i but necessary yeah. at, at least living in seattle i'm not um there's a there's an emerging film community there but it's not nearly as vibrant as la um so yeah i just i, I chose seattle as a place i wanted to live and I wanted to make music for a living and I've had to expand and um, I do maybe one feature a year. Um, the rest of my time is spent, yeah, like you said, doing video game trailers and radio jingles and commercials. Um, yeah, I spread, I, I, f I feel spread very thin sometimes, and, but it's also, it keeps things really interesting, you know, every day is different and I, yeah, I love it. TV is, you know, like often a lot faster paced. You know, often you've had a matter of days to get it done. And I know that you've worked on on tons of shows. You've been nominated for, for you've been nominated for an Emmy. Um, in like a nutshell, what's kind of the the different experience between scoring a film and scoring a show? Joey, um, definitely time frame is is a big part of it, and mainly. Um, the arc of a film is much different than the arc of a television show. They have, a, you know, anywhere from 20 minutes on a half-hour show to 45 minutes or whatever on an hour show to get some point across. And really, in television, music is is important, but it doesn't have the same kind of impact as it does in a film. On a film like Travis's, where I might not even have as you know as much music in that as I would in a television show, the emotional impact the music plays in this film is much more poignant than it is on my TV show. And it's supposed to be. I mean. You know, doing these kinds of projects becomes all encompassing. I mean, heck, I was actually even in his film as the on-camera drummer. So it's like you get it. I get it. Visit the set. I get to be, you know, the part Do by knowing the filmmaker. Yeah. Right. And though I visited the set of my television show, it's not quite the same. Right. So, um, but definitely the, um, the the scope of a film is. Uh, I mean, not that I want to say because by all means, you know, TV music is awesome. I, I love writing it, but there is definitely a different emphasis on the film. The film is a lot more. You know, I have to be, yeah, I just have to be much more on in terms of the music in a film than I do in my TV show sometimes. Mainly because I've developed, listen, the first season of a, of a television show is basically the time where I've created this palette of sounds, thematic qualities, all these things, and then after that I'm just kind of generally recycling and kind of re, you know, repositioning things, and, and maybe you get a new character or whatever, but for the most part you've done your job of developing the sound of that. For a film, you're, you know, working within this long time frame to really kind of find that that special kind of component, you know. And, 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 and how do you um, land on your on your like instrumentation? Like when you're watching a movie, do you think like right away strings? This film like it feels like strings to me. Does the filmmaker often have ideas that you need to work with and change and coax? Like maybe they'll come to you and say, "I want a bongo score like all the way through." <laughs> that would and, be awesome. And, 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 <laughs> like you're looking at it, it's like yeah. I hear you, but that might not work. <laughs> so work for me, but not anyway. <laughs> It'd be really easy. Yeah, it like, would be easy. Yeah. Yeah. And and we, could too. we could do it live. Yeah, but I mean, often I'm sure that you guys are given some wacky ideas, or you know, at, at that start of the film when you're first given a script, or your first, the first time that you sit down and meet with them, like how does that experience go? I mean, what is that process? I don't know if you guys can white hop in there. I mean, I think that. Uh, it, it's always a blessing to work with a director that's got a really clear vision of what they're going for. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've probably all been in the, the opposite situation where they have no idea. And um, and that's the hardest, I think. You know, uh, And I think there's probably very uh, different opinions on whether temp score is helpful or hurtful. 
Um, it can be hurtful if the director becomes married to the temp score, and then uh, your job is to try to replace that without breaking any copyright laws. But um, the if you if the director knows, for me, it's all about like the vibe. Every cue has a specific vibe or energy that it's trying to portray. That it's uh, you know supporting the story, whatever that that moment of the story is, whatever's trying to get across. And you know our job is to uh, highlight that as much as possible without like kind of taking the limelight from what's going on with the drama or the storyline or whatever. Just kind of propel it forward, be ultra supportive, and um, if the director has a clear vision about what he's trying to portray, what what does this cue? Uh, what's the whole point of it? You know what what is the underlying meaning? For me, that that's what helps the most is to, you know, and then I can decide how to orchestrate it and whatnot. You know. Regardless of if he gives me a temp score for there or, or not. What was the most, um, you know, the most uh, intense and satisfying experience that you had by working on a film? Any of you guys? Um, this one for me, this oh, one was for, it was definitely yeah. the most um, the most wonderful experience. Both, you know, I mean, I all of Travis's films that he's done, and I've I've read it from script form first draft mm -hmm. to the end for the most part so it's it's phenomenal to watch that but this one had a lot of special meaning and, it, and it's react the audience's reaction the public's reaction to it has been very special it's great to be a part of something that really you know transcends and people really get um but like you were saying you know it's like working with you know directors because travis's movies barely had any temp in it at all and yet he he definitely kind of knew where he wanted to go emotionally and i he's the second actor i've worked with and i find that actor directors have an incredible I mean, Travis will get up and he'll sit, he'll stand to the side there, and he'll he'll kind of look and he'll think and he'll talk. And they have this emotional content that a director, that, for example, I work with a director that was an editor, doesn't have the same kind of component. He's better editor than he's a director. But Travis has that because he knows how to work with actors in particular. It's just a different emotional experience, and I seem to really get off on that a lot more. I really am like, all right, you know, and and so he allows me, he gives me some more creative freedom, and um, we tend to be we're on the same page. So it just becomes more of like. You know, I kind of come to him with these ideas, and he's like, "That's kind of what I was, what I was, you know, feeling." And we kind of work that out, and that it just becomes what it is. I generally kind of, I don't know, generally always from, from the script phase, but I know once I see it, and it's generally once I see that first cut, I have a clear picture, image, imagery of what I'm kind of going for. Then I kind of feel better about how to match something kind of to it. But um, this ex this experience has been by far the most rewarding, I think, so far. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So the, the score is is kind of like an actor. It's like an, in, in, a um, in, in, visible actor that's like on the screen that you don't see, right? It's a that that tells the audience like how to feel. When I mean, you know, like in your score that that had you know this kind of impact is actually very sparse. You know where you let let the score have a lot of air and like in, you 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 like let it uh, um, breathe a bit. Um, when do you know to step in and when do you know that you have to kind of like step back and let the like movie tell its own story um in fact i had more things sometimes in the score and actually travis would say let's pull that out like sometimes it was just even too much because i want to color things sometimes and i had a, a sound designer on board um luckily second time i've done for him where we pretty much had only live instruments which is again not my norm so it's even more exciting that i get to work with people um and but the sound designer is playing live Though he's doing um, process sounds, you know, e wee and so score, stuff. Not, not yeah. sound design, he's, like, or, he's, like music design. Music, more music design in that sense. Yeah, not not sound, not actual film sound, but yeah, music sound design kind of thing. Where we're you know creating palettes and, and pads and ambient textures and things like this. Um, but you know, kind of working in, in that frame is is uh, is pretty incredible. So the restraint factor comes from the fact that we've kind of dialed in on exactly how much we need to kind of put in the scene or not. And a tendency for me, sure, is to kind of do a little bit more, say a little bit more, and then I have to kind of, then Travis will say something about her, you know, and back off a bit. We'll take some things out. We're going to go to its core, and then kind of start from there and as, as well. So it, it's, it's effective because this was the type of movie where, again, when you have performances that, and it's not, we don't always work on movies with great performances, right. and we are in there as a band-aid sometimes, but this became, I didn't have to get in the way of a lot of this at all. And in fact, I was there to support it more, and I had an amazing, um, comment from one of the uh, the gentlemen at the Q and A who I mean at the screen who was I guess running it was talking about how he doesn't always pay attention to music, but he paid attention to this and in the good way of paying attention to it, not that it's in your face or you're like, oh my gosh, but it's more about 
it hits you where it's supposed to. You know, I'm my family is a bunch of composers. My cousin Tom, Tom Newman, and Randy Newman, David, and my cousin Tom is somebody I've idled. His uh, and his whole thing is it gets kind of here subconscious. So. I love when it hits you and you don't know it's kind of hitting you, but it's there and it's right. kind of coming out. So this approach works fantastic on this movie in particular. I think, you know, you know it's there and we're coming in at specific spotting moments since we're not in the whole movie, but we come in at the right times just so you know and, you know, it makes you kind of feel just that much more, I think, as the scene goes on. That's awesome. Cody, you actually made a film about your experience and your father, and you wrote the film and you shot it and everything. How is it like doing everything? You know, having those like years and years of experience of scoring, being responsible for the entire film, and how much of film scoring do you think is really the art of making movies as opposed to making, you know, music? That's a lot. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, well, I know that you can take it. Um, so yeah, uh, it's actually kind of a going back to the the favorite film scoring question, right? Because it, it ties into this. Um, I wouldn't say it's favorite, but in uh, in 2007, my dad passed away, and that year I found myself working on a documentary film about a runner named Dean Carnassus, who some of you may have heard of. Um, he's basically an ultra marathoner and so forth, and um, so I was writing the music for that. Didn't really know much about running, wasn't very interested in, in running <laughs> up to that point. Yeah. And that, that film really, um, in the process of figuring out the music, I decided, well, let's at least give this running thing a try. I feel like I need to do my due diligence. Cool. And um, that was about six months after my dad passed away. I was in the deepest depression of my life, and I suddenly felt myself turning a little bit and um, asked the director, who was a very accomplished runner as well, like, do you think I could run a marathon? Like, <laughs> like kind of stupidly. Um, and uh, six months later, I was at the starting line of my first marathon, uh, right after we finished scoring the film, actually. So it was kind of this, this whole scoring the, I, I guess I call it the daddy of my film or whatever, mm -hmm. um, was very much, it was all one process to, to some degree. And as I was uh, training for this marathon, um, the director of Ultra Marathon Man, JB, suggested that I get a camera and document as much as I can. We could have like a little special features thing about how the composer becomes like a runner. <laughs> um, and, it, and so it was kind of this cool little thing. And after, after the marathon, which was just an amazing experience, one of the hardest experiences in my life, um, just because six months is not really uh, <laughs> a very, uh, you generally would want a longer <laughs> period of time uh, to yeah. get off the couch and then to run a marathon. Um, <laughs> so I, I've done many since, and they've been much, man. they've been much oh, yeah. less painful than that first one. Um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I ended up with about like I don't know, 25 hours of footage or something like that. And I've I've always kind of dabbled in Final Cut and been you know fascinated by that editing and so forth and mm -hmm. the process was pretty long um, just because I was doing real work as I called it at the same time right. you know scoring other people's movies um, but I ended up with a nice little cut of about 20 25 minutes and um, all temped with stuff um, that I that I had done previously and I will say that that. For me, that was the hardest part of the process. I had my own version of Temp Love. I mean, because I got really? so, well, being an editor, you're, you're working with these tracks day in, day out. They're, they're there, you're hearing them over and over again. You're taking frames out of the video. You're maybe making a little crossfade with the music there. And so it just gets through your head. Right. And um, a couple of the tracks, I ended up just being like, screw it, they, they work perfect. Why would I try to recreate something there? Mm -hmm. And then a couple of tracks um, I decided could possibly work better. I would just, I was, I kind of vowed just to try my best, <laughs> and um, I did end up replacing those, but it was very, very difficult um, getting, getting that out of my head. I, I, I had a bit of a window into how directors must feel. The, the difference being, I, I like to think it was a little harder for me because I, I had yeah. to sit there and, you know, and have a love myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it was a quite an interesting Not process. The, the whole, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it, it, was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, in terms of like, I mean, we're all storytellers here. I mean, we are supplementary to the film, but I think um, I, most most projects that I think all of us work on, I mean, we are we have to get into that story and really own it a little bit to to really be able to tell it from a musical standpoint. And so um, it, I, I want to say making any of any of us could could easily, you know, well, not easily, it's not, it's a hard process, but oh yeah, we could, we could make a film. I mean, it's the same process. It's just with video and uh, a, telling a story. That, yeah, telling yeah. a story. That's great. Um, how much time we got left? We got about 15 minutes. Uh, 
40, yeah, 45. For, uh, 45 minutes, okay? Uh-oh. Video would have been nice. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about finances a little bit. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. So when you're are you approaching uh, a, or when, when someone's asking you to score their film and they're saying, I want you to do it, I know that you'll love it, it's like right up your alley, but I've spent all my money on the acting and all my money on the cameraman and I only have a little bit left. What are some of the, if, like if you have any, what are some of the options there? Like maybe owning the score, um, publishing rights, talk, talk like a bit about that. I don't know, you know, any of you guys can like hop on that if you want. Okay. Cool. Um, I think coming at the end of a project, you know, they've, uh, that the music's always the last thing to be approached, you know, it's the last thing to be added. And they're always over budget, and they're always uh, back up against the wall with a, a deadline as well, usually. So um, something that, I mean, you probably have a lot of experience with that with television, especially, you know, we need it tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. But I think that happens a lot in film as well. Um, the budget is a, is a tough thing. I mean, you, you want, if you like the project, you're willing to do it. That, that's what it comes down to. Uh, you know, we all want to kind of attach our names to something that, that we can be proud of. And um, being an artist, I think uh, the art comes first in a lot of ways and, and the money comes second. And, you know, sometimes to a detriment, maybe. Uh, we, we don't, yeah. Well, you know, you, the business side of it is, is less important when you dedicate your life to something like music, I think. If you really love music, then you want the opportunities to... Um, have the platform to have your art uh, highlighted, you know? I mean, I know with Psalm, it's, it, for me, it's like the best uh, opportunity to have people experience music that I've written, you know, uh, up until this point. Um, so the, I put the entire budget towards uh, recording the live music because that, to me, that was more important than having some money in my pocket. Um, and I, I think uh, owning the, the rights to the music is a good kind of compromise when it, when it comes to that. You know, it's always a gamble if you're ever going to see anything on the back end anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're going to pour everything you have into music uh, and they're, they're not going to pay you well for it, then it's probably, you know, uh, I think everyone agrees that it's only fair that you, you retain the rights to that. So um, that's probably a good kind of solution in those low budget situations. Yeah, I, I found that's a, in my career in indie film especially, it's it's just oftentimes, more often than not, it's, there's so little left uh, at that end stage. And I have a lot of sound designer friends that feel that as well, um, doing the sound editing and sound mixing. They, they face that uh, a little bit as well. But for us music people, and I know Josh, you have a similar business model to me, is um, one, one way you know that you kind of have to go in, in a way um, to be sustainable mm -hmm. is um, keeping those rights right. and then um, you you know maybe you have like a library exactly you know, like license it for precisely films, for or shows. You, it's more yeah, yeah I would say the, films. yeah I, I would say that most of my repurposing is done in TV like blanket right. deals type stuff cool. but um, but that's just a crucial part of the business I know Josh has a similar kind of philosophy I mean it's 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 basically like okay well um, you have Two thousand bucks, or something like that, for what should be fifteen, um, and basically, okay, well, I'll do my best and write you a score, but um, it's gonna it's gonna go into my library in a year, or something like that. So that that sort of thing kind of has to. And some some directors um, are totally cool with that, like don't have all a problem. And then some, you kind of have to explain to them why why that's the case. Um, I mean. Obviously, if they have their their budget, kind of basically dictates what the terms will be. So, if you're doing an indie film and you're trying to find, um, you know, a score for it, what's what's the best way to do it? I mean, do I reach out to agencies, reach out to ASCAP, to to reach out to your friends? Like, how have you found, you know, folks that haven't, you know, who are doing their first film? How do they find you? I off the top of my head. Like any of you guys. Just, Word of mouth. I mean, yeah. most of my business yeah. comes from referrals. I mean, I've, I've had a few agents over the years, right. and um, I've just found that mo I get most of my work just from people recommending and stuff like that. And from time to you know, I, I still reach out to, if, if something catches my ear, like, oh, that sounds cool. I'll, I'll shoot off a quick email and say, hey, what's up? Uh, you know, 
and uh, you know, actually some great projects, Tim being a, a great example, I mean, come from just that initial like, hey, <laughs> we have, on the internet, like yeah, like, uh, I mean, uh, another one of my, uh, my passions, you know, sports, mm -hmm. um, came from just emailing this guy, uh, there was a, there was a commercial on Universal Sports, which uh, is kind of the baby to NBC Sports, uh, and they carry a lot of like pro cycling and stuff like that, so I had that on. Uh, one morning they advertised a series called Take a Seat, which was about this guy um, riding his bike across the USA, uh, picking up uh, disabled people along the way, like to, run, uh, to ride a tandem, basically. And, and it had like a website, so I went to the website, I emailed him, I was like, hey, that sounds pretty cool, like let me know if you, you know, if you already have your music settled or whatever, or if you want to talk. And um, sure enough, we got together and I scored the series. Um, and that led to a bunch of other opportunities at NBC. So it's like you never know where. So you have to, that you have sort to of put yourself and stuff like out there, though, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like that's you can't that's like the only way. Like away in your yeah. studio. And I wish you could. Like <laughs> <thundering>. <laughs> that's true. I mean, it's not like you're agent necessarily. I mean, I, I mean, agents are. It's, it's kind of like what I say about joining the union, the musicians' union. You mm -hmm. don't join unless you have to. You don't really need an agent until you need one, because right. ultimately. I, we've all gotten, gotten our own gigs via these kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I want just to get back quickly, just, I want to talk about your finance thing, because that's, a, I think, a really interesting mm -hmm. question. Um, because all of us here, you know, as we all try to make a living as musicians, which is, they don't go hand in Not hand. Not easy to do. Yeah. Um, the, the point, you know, it's like, all, I mean, when I went to school, as all we did, we all wanted, you know, we want to create. Mm -hmm. We were artists. And all of us would do this for free, but we don't want to do it for free. I mean, the reality is, is like, right. And as a painter, you know, you, you paint, and all of a sudden some, someone says, I'll pay you a million dollars for that. And you're like, really? this? Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I love it. You know? So the blessing that we all have is to do this for a living, and someone wants to pay us. The unfortunate and one of the places like where ASCAP is fighting so hard is to be able to retain our ability to keep doing this and make a living at it. So, um, you know, it's, you know, I, yes, I work in television, which allows me, what affords me differently than if I were to do indie films for a living, which I would love to do, but I would never be able to support myself in the way that I do. And so, I, you know, it becomes, we have to navigate two hats as a businessman and as a, an artist. And I think the hardest part is that none of us really want to do the business stuff. We'd rather do the artist stuff, but the business stuff is coming so much more into play in today's world right. where technology and social and all this, you know, and we can find jobs in so many different ways that like Cody was talking about. But also, um, you know, we're, we're trying to sustain, you know, I know that Travis, you know, whatever budget he's going to have, he's going to have, and I'm going to have to navigate whatever that means. I know that I might not make a lot of it, not much more like, you know, where you own the works or whatever it might be, that's great. Um, but again, it's that balance of, I try to, to, make, to get some work to where I'm, or where I'm really getting paid well, and other work where I can go off and just do something I love to do. Um, and you know, if all of us could just get a job that makes us enough money to do what we want to do, really, you know, that's what I know. Part of us are kind of into that, but certainly, being able to work within all the budgets is what we is what we do for a living. We never wanted to do that. I didn't go to school learning how to how to you know budget my own orchestral session and what payroll services cost and what all the union hours mean and all that. But that's ends up what hap with what happens. Right. And you have to figure out all that stuff at the same time put on the composer hat. And so it's a lot of work. I mean, nobody knows I think how much work goes into even the simplest of scores. You know, I mean, so all of that is, it's, it's, it's an incredible process and so meaningful to all of us. Luckily, we work with people who really, you know, respect that and understand that. That's great. Yeah. Um, so you have to be your own, your own, your own line manager, your own attorney, your own agent, your own, I mean, your own office. copyist, yeah. your own, <laughs> you're it, conductor, right? you're, you're, you're all your happens, score right? supervisor. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I don't know anyone who's able to sustain themselves purely on scoring indie films. I mean, there's always other things that you have to yeah, do. Yeah. Well, when I look at like the, like the yeah. Hurt Locker, can win, you know, with, with that movie, didn't use a budget on that, and he was doing stuff at his place and his mm -hmm. bathrooms, just, you know, and he's a big, well, he was a big composer, but still, you know, people are making fantastic movies. I mean, Any Day Now is a, is a great movie that wasn't made for $25 million, you know, or $50 million. So you can make incredible movies yeah. for, for not a lot of money anymore, and that does affect our bottom line in terms of what we can do, because it's not like the studio is necessarily, it's not like Fox Scoring Stage is going to change the price just because yeah. your movies, you know what I mean? But it's, it's hurting all of us, too, at the same time. It's hurting those studios. It's hurting musicians if we're not going to be able to, to make enough money to sustain it as well. Well, and it forces us to be our own uh, producers and engineers, and I mean, you have to these yeah. days uh, know how to run Pro Tools, know how to run Logic, know uh, how to kind of invest in the right 
uh, preamp and the right mic set because you don't always have the budget to go into a studio, you know, and a lot of times you do have to go into the bathroom to get good reverb and whatnot. And it's, <laughs> you no, know, seriously, though, you have to, you have to be able to wear uh, like at least 20 hats. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and what you were saying about putting on the composer hat, that's a big hat to wear. I mean, you have to get into the right headspace in order to create the art that you're trying to create. It's not like you can just be like, okay, inspiration, come, you know? Yeah, I mean, you do have exactly. And a great example, I have three kids. So when you think about what it means to do what we do 20 hours a day sometimes, and we're, invo we're involved in Where's it. Where's daddy? Where is that the component? So I have to not only do business hat, composer hat, then dad hat. And I gotta come home and I have to be able to be attentive and, and there. And I don't know about you guys, but decompressing from a full day of writing is pretty exhausting yeah. to come in. So it's like there's all of these elements that you navigate. But I think it builds us to be, you know, we're, we're, more, we're more emotionally connected by all these different things that we have to do. And then we get invested and it's like, I mean, it's a, it's a dream to do this at the same time. It's brutal, you know? It has its moments that are just like, has really it gotten harder, you think? I mean, it seems like there's more and more opportunities for media. I mean, there's video games, and there's webisodes, and there's indie films out there, but there's a lot of people that are getting into film scoring, and there's all these all these like, libraries that are giving away stuff for free. Right. So has it gotten harder, you guys, or has it always been hard? I think it's the same. The same. I, okay. When I first started, it was, uh, right about the time like the samples were just getting good enough that you could create a pretty convincing score without live musicians and also DV was on a huge rise. HD wasn't quite in yet, but it was coming. And um, I mean, nowadays, I mean, I have a DSLR. I could make a movie if I wanted to. I mean, it's it's crazy. You could, you could create pretty good quality imagery, good quality scoring for, you know, all inside the box these days, basically. Mm -hmm. And, but I think that I think that just creates more content, and the fact that more people are doing it everywhere, um, it's it's kind of like, I, I feel like the industry, I don't know if you guys feel the same way, it's it's very segmented, right? Like there's the webisodes, there's uh, indie film, there's short indie film, there <laughs> there's there's long indie film, there's documentary, there are, there's narratives, I mean, so I think I, I think you got kind of become known in one genre or another to some degree, and that will fan out a bit, and then you right. can kind of try to work on another genre, and that will right. fan out a bit. But um, I mean, there's always stiff competition, as I'm sure we all yeah. agree on that. I mean, it's cre like, I mean, I had a friend who I uh, like put up on Craigslist that he was looking for like I can't remember like I think a shooter or something like that, and he got 600 and something responses. Oh my God. Like this is I mean. So like I mean it's insane how yeah. I, I think when I was looking for an assistant I put up an ad on Craigslist mm -hmm. and I got like 200 responses within like a few hours. I mean it was like even to just go through 200 responses yeah. and to give each person the credit like that they like to look at okay who is this person? I mean a lot of it was junk like like people that were just I want to be in the entertainment business and you know yeah, stuff like that like that. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, looking yeah, for yeah, someone yeah. who could you know catalog music yeah. and stuff like that, but. Um, I mean, it's just, there are a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, and, and they certainly get weeded out. I mean, there might be a ton of people, but how many of them are actually going to really you know, money be effective? waters, I guess is yeah. what I'm saying. It's, so it certainly does. It makes it more so difficult tough. for all of us. Yeah, for sure. But we're not crying. <laughs> <laughs> so for someone who's aspiring to do what you guys do, what are the basic skills that they need, and what would be the overall advice of how to get into the industry, how to get into scoring and, and making my money at it and being able to pay your rent. It's like, so money is your first priority? <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess. Well, like, yeah, maybe that's like, I mean, <laughs> like, a baker. Like, 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 if I was 18 and I go, man, I really would love to score films, what would you say to me? Um, okay. Uh, you got any of you guys? Yeah. So, I think, I mean, we all probably got started, I'm, well, I, I could just speak for myself, but I, I got started doing a lot of short films. Like right at, when I was in school, uh, we I, I went to USC, we were right across the street from the, not even across the street, it was right next door to the film school. Um, put up signs, you know, and you do a lot of shorts for free um, at that point, but you, you make relationships, you get a dramatic sense, and you learn a lot from those collaborations, and um, you will hopefully go up to you know, independent short films, and then maybe even features, and it just, it's just all a contact list, it's really a Rolodex, I mean, mm -hmm. it is what it ends up being, and those relationships that you have with, you know, directors, Tim and I are, are hopefully going to talk about his next film soon, right Tim? I mean, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it really is, you, you impress people, you do your best work, and you hope that that speaks That's great. for itself. Where do you think I would oh, sorry, just sorry, to jump in real quick. I, I would yeah. uh, I would highly recommend to the people trying to write to really get into uh, actually being able to write music 
and not rely on uh, MIDI kind of synthestrating and, uh, you know, get down with a piano and some pencil and paper and, and roll up your sleeves and, like, study the scores of the masters that came before you. Because if you, uh, if you do get a command of uh, the language that is music, then um, your kind of, your mobility when you're presented with opportunities will, will be there. And, you know, um, I think we all know how diverse you have to be able to, uh, you know, you have to be able to uh, play all these different kind of emotional um, standpoints, basically, you know, and, 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 and thrive in those settings. You know, you have to be able to write for strings. You have to be able to write brass. You have to be able to uh, do percussion ensemble things. You have to understand uh, how to write jazz. You have to understand, you know, it's, it's pretty uh, overwhelming in a way uh, and kind of daunting to a beginner, I would think, of, of how much you have to know. So rather than rely on, you know, all the sounds that are out there and, like, start playing with your computer, um, get, to the, get to the roots of, of what makes quality music, and I think that'll serve you well. I was going to say, you know, this is a question that comes up all the time. Is, you know, how do, I, how do I get into the business? How do I do all this? And it's interesting, you know, because I've, I've asked, I was at, I spoke at this um, SCL meeting, which is a society composes lyricists back in L.A., and, you know, the, the, like, one of the things was just this kid just came to L.A. He was trying to find an apartment, you know. It's like, when it comes to bare bone about just even, how do you survive in a city full of, you know, entertainment and composers, for that matter? Um, but I think you're right. I mean, from a musical standpoint, you know, it's almost like it's a, it's a B component to our job. You know, the A component is, um, you know, can you, can you get a job? How, what's your character like? Do people want to work with you? Are you a collaborator? Are you confident? Are you a complete jerk? You know, like, how, what are you like as a person? Because any filmmaker who's insecure about his film is not going to want to work with a guy who's insecure about himself and, right. and also doesn't have any idea. And, you know, and so it's like it's the catch-22 of like you need the credits to get the job, but how do you get the credits? Right. So everybody goes through this whole thing, and then it comes down to like what I always say to folks is that, well, what do you, you know, at the beginning, what are your strengths? What are you good at doing? What do you love? What, are, you a, are you a passionate person, are you a programmer, are you a, a guy who's really good at copying, are you, you know, what, what, what are some of your full strengths, and then how do you want to apply that, do you want to work for a composer, do you want to go off on your own, because we all know, eventually it's going to be your own contacts that are going to get you any jobs, not your agent, it's not anybody else, you know, everybody can help you as much as possible, but you have to sustain those relationships and be somebody they want to work with, and that's not an easy thing to tell people, but I tell schools all the time, get a course of psychology, get something where you can teach kids to have you know, almost like public debate or just speaking to people or I've known so many composers in social settings that can't even hold a conversation that isn't talking about, you know, flat D7 flat 9 or it's like you want to be able to also speak about the world or something yeah. like that and it helps. I mean, like, look at the Cody situation where you have a sports, you have a there's a whole right. worldly component that, that is unique for people who are going to want to talk to you about, you know, just life in general, you know. Not and and if you're void of that component, then you're not going to be able to do the job when the, when the opportunity is Yeah. I think that we're towards the end of the um, hour. Yeah? Okay. A mic, please. Yeah. Um, I apologize if you've already covered this. Um, but in terms of editing, if I'm editing a piece and it's a documentary or a short, um, and I edit to a temp that, I, that I've picked, um, and then you try to match that with the, with the music that you compose or put together. What would you recommend in terms of the type of temps, or is there any difference, or the length, or or different types of temps in different parts? Because I've never done that before, and I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea. If you uh, hear a piece of music that that captures what you're trying to portray, mm -hmm. that that's a, the best temp. Even if we end up uh, orchestrating it completely differently or going a different angle, I, I think if you if you know uh, the the energy that, that's trying to be coming come across, that 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 would be. I mean, you, so just listen to music. You know, I mean, Tchaikovsky might be a great uh, example of what you're going for, and we might not write in that exact classical style, um, or we may. It, it, you know. And then the, the related question is because when you when when I edit, I try to edit to a beat of some sort, not necessarily. I'm not a musical person, so I don't know how to express it. But I'm listening to music, and I'm trying to match it sure. in some way or another. So is that then a process that you then, after what you've done, then the editor goes back and re readjusts? Some sometimes there is like a a bit of playback and forth. Um, 
with the film I was mentioning earlier, Ultra Marathon Man, we went back and forth the whole time, which is, if I ever work with JB again, I told him I'm, we're going to have a music editor on board because there are so many picture changes that go back and forth. So that can't, if that's something that you've kind of beforehand worked out, that that's going to be the case, that can be really an amazing kind of confluence between editing and, um, and, and doing music. One thing I've done in the past is like kind of provide like a bed, like just like the, the, you know, the basic musical idea, let them edit and then once the edit come back, comes back, then we you know, add the bells and whistles, so to speak. Um, and that's been kind of a cool experience. I was gonna say quickly about that. Just don't forget our job, no matter what, is to do that. So we're, whatever you put in there, as long as, what Brian said is I think very important. If you can hit the emotional component, our job is to interpret that and take it. I think a lot of editors, in, in particular in television, they, because I get a lot of specific temp cut to picture of the whole nine yards, and sometimes they get so involved in it, and I say, don't forget, I'm there already to do all that job. If you give me the, the tool emotionally, I'll, I'll make it work, no matter what, how you cut it. Thank yeah. you. And sometimes the opposite angle goes too. Uh, I know like if, if there's gonna be a really specific kind of battle scene that's choreographed or whatever, a lot of times they'll wait to cut until, and I think composers generally hate this, we like to have a locked picture to work with first, or at least I know I do, but I, there are also situations where if there's a specific scene, I know like with Gladiator, when they cut that, uh, they had the the music ahead of time. Like so, he wrote like just the most kind of triumphant battle music that he could write, and then they cut the the scene which, to that. Which is really effective, I think, yeah. in a lot of cases. Like when I did the music for the Tour de France, we I, I basically wrote the theme. It was a demo at that point. I didn't even know I had the gig. And then I get in, in my email box like <laughs> a video file of of like the animatic cut to the music. And for that type of main title, you absolutely want like it frame accurate on the beat of the music so in that sort of situation it's it's really beneficial to kind of go go back and forth a bit so. hi i want you to ask a question um how to what extent do you worry about your own originality and do you have the same kind of issues with respect to copyright that a songwriter might have Silence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're all yeah. extremely uh, worried about our own originality. As an artist, your your voice is your what you're representing. You know, I think the hardest thing to do uh, as a player or as a writer is to find your a uh, unique voice and your own stamp on it. And if you can do that, then uh, that's where the work comes because they they'll be like, I want the sound that Brian writes or whatever the, it might be. Um, and copyright infringement is a huge thing. I mean, you don't, there's so many cases uh, along the way, uh, you know, the whole John Williams with Star Wars, Gustav Holtz, Planets situation. There, there's a lot of that that happens. Um, and you want to avoid that, you know, you don't want to be known as the guy that blatantly ripped off uh, Schumann or whatever. So, uh, Finding your own voice is, is key, and it's a never-ending process, I think, you know? Yeah, you always are refining it, you know? Uh, as an artist, you're always, like, digging to the next level, like, uh, trying to better yourself and kind of uh, find the, maybe the purest form of what your voice might be. So I think we're all searching for that, and sometimes you just don't have the time to do that, though. You know, if you have to crank out 90 minutes of music in uh, six weeks, that's tough. Yeah, do what I mean, you can. And then your filmmaker falls in love with that temp that you're trying to do. And, I, and, and originally, I mean, you know, when you come to, one of the first things that my agent ever said to me early on was, you know, when I was young, starting off is, you know, what's your voice? What do you have to say? I'm like, well, I'm in my 20s, you know? I'm, I mean, for a lot of things, I wasn't, you know, didn't have a voice for a lot of things yet. And, and I think that was part of, you know, I don't know, you know, what does it mean to me? And part of it is that the filmmakers don't sometimes give you that, oh, no, that right. avenue to be able to find an, an originality because they're so married to, some template they have in there, and then you're just kind of doing a satellite version. You're trying to find a way to make it say, well, this is my, this is Cody Stamp, this is, you know, Josh, this, this is what we have to say. Here's our kind of signature feel, maybe, or, you know, we're kind of known for using a certain type of thing or doing it a certain way. But outside of that, I mean, like, you know, I remember, you know, my cousin Tom would spend so much time creating a score that he was given this ample amount of time beyond any composer I'd ever seen. And yes, he can create something incredible with a huge budget and a ma major amount of time because all of us could. Find a voice. But we don't have that kind of time frame. So we're just trying to find and navigate that within that. And originality-wise, I think we're just trying to be as you know, innovative as, and, and interesting and creative as we can within that. And something comes from it as time goes on. You know? yeah. Anything else? Anybody?
Well, I think I'm going to wrap. Any last um, closing, closing <laughs> statements from you guys? Go see all of our movies. There we go. Yeah, yes. Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.